Thank you. Stephen is a member of the Interface Center, married to another member of the Interface Center, and Jane Sampson is a history professor. Stephen and I only met four or five years ago, maybe, yeah. when you came to Edmonton. I think it was probably five, because I had to go through the checkup with everybody that knew my wife, so... Well, of course, <laughs> we've had to met you. We I wasn't allowed into Edmonton until I was cleared, I guess, but... Yes, well, that's fair enough. That's what we do for our friends. Anyway, Stephen has a, a rich and varied career in the military, and this has come, I, I would say, directly out of that, right? So... Um, it has with my relationship. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on the monument project, because I'll just go over it lightly for you, because the biggest one I want to talk about is the Healing and Remembrance Service, which we had on November 10th. So I brought a few things here, and the concept for the whole park started uh, through my work with South, South Alberta Light Horse. I'm the liaison for my church to them. I probably know half them anyhow besides that, but um, <coughs> the uh, park that was beside the old armories in Old Strathcona was made from the 19th Alberta Dagoons back in the early, early 1900s. And the 19th Alberta Dagoons were officially rolled into what is now South Alberta Light Horse. It's a combination of many units. It's a Canadian way of quietly moving things so they don't have to pay more money. So it's a combination of things. And they're a cavalry unit. So in the old days, they'd have been riding on horses. Now they're into tanks, which they got taken away. And now they're into doing reconnaissance, which is lighter, faster, easier, and notably cheaper. cheaper. <laughs> Being in the Canadian Forces, I can tell you, we're very skilled at doing a lot less, you know. Americans have a different uniform for every environment, different weapon for every temperature. It goes on and on. We get one thing and we have to use it wisely. So this park was designed with the intentions of um, linking together a number of things in the area of Old Strathcona for the history aspect and also to celebrate the horsemanship that Albertans were very well known for, particularly in the First World War. So the, the, the part of this is this would be the park. The armories would be somewhere over here. And even further would be the railhead. Please, Jeff, yeah, we'll trade up. Yeah, okay. You can do that. Whatever works best for you. So uh, the idea is that in the 1900s, just as they went to World War I, the armories was very active. This area is where the men and the horses would have mustered to be processed through the armories to cross over dirt road, whatever road it was back then, to board the trains to go to points east to go overseas. This is also the point in the Steel Park where they were either brought back, injured, or in some cases, dead. And they would have, families would have picked them up there, and people would have greeted them. Holy Trinity Anglican Church, which we technically read about in front of Meta, mm -hmm. was the oh, regimental yeah. church oh. for 19th Alberta Dagoons and for the various units that were rolled into Sal Sally Horses and Caught. So that was the first aspect that linked all this together, because people don't see the benefit of what the armories was beforehand. They all remembered it as a restaurant. Yeah. or a bar or something. They all remember it as yes, yeah. which is currently there. Yeah. Is the armory is that red brick building? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I've, 80, been, yeah. I've been there several times. That's not, but I've never connected. It's on 85th. It's right really about over here. Yeah. Well, you wouldn't because 19 Alberta Good Dunes, you only see that now on eBay and places that are selling memorabilia. Mm -hmm. Because it was taken off the ORBAT, which is the Organizational Battle, they need for the horses, which changes with every government and changes with every new person promoted to general, I think. Uh, I'm not cynical about the military, by the way, don't worry about that. <laughs> I'm just amazed at some of the things we've done over the years where you're looking at going, really? So now, like I said, this will link it all together. And I have an interesting point is that during World War I, because Albertans are so well known for their abilities with horses, horse breaking and riding, Many of them, uh, who are also part of the group before between the Boer War and the uh, Frontiersmen, which is another group I belong to, ended up in Southampton, where the, the remount depots were, because they were breaking the horses for the Commonwealth, Commonwealth troops over in Europe. Oh. So this, this involves all that. Mm -hmm. 
it took some wrangling, and if you ever want to get something named in the city, please set aside a long time oh. and like paperwork. But in September 2012, we had it named Light Horse Park. So it incorporates the horse aspect, all the units that are now in Light Horse and Sally Horse and Sally Horse itself. We got uh, IBI Group to do drawings for us, and that's where these ones are done because if it was me, it'd be brown paper and crayons, but that's okay. I'd use colorful crayons. So this is the idea of what it would look like. This is the drawing that we have, you'll see in colors, phases. And the reason we have phases is just like anything where you're trying to raise money and funds for it. They come in dribs and drabs. You're either an overnight millionaire or you're picking for scraps somewhere down the line. So we've got it set so that we can get stuff done as we go. As it stands currently, this little green blob here is a mo monument or a cenotaph that the Legion, Royal Canadian Legion put in that park in 1967, and then pretty much forgot about it. So we've been using that to do a parade in the last five years in that area, and it has too many trees and far more people coming every year, which we either reenact Bella Wood or we stand really close and pretend we're a small group. Mm -hmm. So being the man I was, I put my hand up, because I'm usually the parade marshal there, except for this year, because I was doing something else, and said, hey, why don't we move said monument to the very open area over here. That being said, everyone looked at me and said, okay, you put your hand up and run with it. This I do not recommend. Last time I did, I fell out of aircraft, but that's okay, I did that too. <coughs> so what happened is we came together with a group. Uh, our now premier was, is represented on the uh, panel that I chair, Linda Duncan, the MP, and most, and most notable people within Old Strathcona, including the Community League, the Business Association, the Old Historical Foundation, and uh, the Fringe. Anybody that uses that park is now on the panel. They like, all unanimously said, let's go ahead with it. Now we're just doing the fundraising, so we're, we're finding people with really deep pockets that want to donate. And that's the monument aspect. The really unique part of this is going to be that we intend to use the paving stones, which all of them were donated, which was a miracle, because we want to have them etched. Hey, are you familiar with Dollar, Dollar Place up on 111? It's just across um, from the petroleum crop out in Elba. It was set up by the, oh. yeah, it was set up for military families that have to go to a hospital or something where they can bring their family and stay there. They did a, a paving stone um, concept where people donated money and they had their name etched on it, or the name of a loved one. Typically, parks like this usually have names of soldiers only. And as you'll hear in the Healing and Remembrance, I'm not big on that, because it's not about the victors, it's about people impacted by war. So we're going to do the same thing, but you could put anyone's name on it. If you come from a German background, yeah, you could put a name down. If you come from the former Yugoslavia, Bosnia, and Serbia, whatever, we'll obviously not allow ranks that are we crankle people. There we go. So, but it's going to be a true community park for everybody. So that even those who might not see Remembrance Day as something they want to participate in, because their war may have been somewhere in Africa or some part of the world that we can't pronounce or didn't even know it happened, but they're still impacted. They can put a name of a loved one donating. I'm not quite sure what the figure is. Looking about fifty bucks for a paving stone, and it will be incorporated into the causeway. So people can come year-round and have that place of memorial remembrance where they can see the name of their loved one and make themselves feel a lot more included in our, what do they use on radio? Our wonderful cultural <coughs> music and diversity. So, and it, churches are included in that, right? Because more often than not, it's only a small portion of people that seem to want to be involved. Is this your backside's problem? Um, so that's the biggest, one of the biggest parts of this is going to really draw it together. It's going to draw the history of the entire community, and that means everybody. You know, it's going to have the aspect of people having been able to come there now and find a quiet place with benches to sit, maybe take that stone that was to their loved one, or loved ones, depends on how much they want, and make it a really true community focus. 
but given that we have all the major players involved, I think we're going to pull that off. It's just getting in the money. So that's the other thing. If you're ever going to go for grants, again, put a lot of time aside mm -hmm. and really let paperwork because uh, it can be maddening at times, especially if there's more than one player involved. In this case, it's the city of Edmonton. It's uh, Old Strathcona Remembers, which we named it on a fly because somebody was asking questions for media. So it really came up really well and quick and stuff. Uh, South Alberta Light Horse is involved, Old Trinity Ableton, Trinity Lutheran, uh, and uh, like I said, a major other players. So that's the monument and the monument aspect that you want, I wanted to talk about to that point. The interesting facts in this is not one brick was ever we had to pay for. 5,500 total bricks we got for this project. All are rescued from various sites in Edmonton and one in the new uh, places that were at least 100 years old or older. So they're two at a time. And they will also be incorporated in aspects of the big cement shield, which will be the Alberta shield. Monument will be there, we'll have two little walls here. And um, yeah, 5,500 bricks. We got them from Leamington Manor, which used to be uh, 104 and 114. And it burnt down a year or so ago. Mm -hmm. And it was a beautiful historic building. So my thoughts started with why not incorporate some of Edmonton's history into this and give that chance to live on it. We got bricks from the University of Alberta that were the houses they tore down in Saskatchewan Drive when they put in the new leadership oh, school. Really? Mm -hmm. So well, Carl Armand was the pro at then. He's a good guy. He's a friend. The new pro was not that way. But that's okay. I still have friends in the ranks there, so it helps. So we got some from a uh, site in Leduc, which was one of the first mayors had built it, and it was over 100 years old. And as I said in CBC Radio, I became a bit of a brick stalker. If I saw something coming apart, falling down, or being left, I approached everybody and said, you don't want to get rid of those, do you? And that was how we got the paving stones, because I saw that the um, Fringe Theatre and, and the theatre just off of, by the, the old Strathcona Market, they were doing renovations, and I thought, so I started talking to them and said, well, if we have any left, we'll give them to you. So not so many bricks because they reincorporated them, which was even better because it's a green aspect, recycling. But they had nine and a half pallets of paving stones, which we were a little bit short on. Mm. So this gave us the ability to cross, uh, pull, go forward on the idea of etched paving stones to be donated. So it's got the green aspects into it. And it's got the historical aspects. It's got the community and it's got a unified approach through faiths, individual groups, and it is going to be a place that is truly a community aspect. Nothing short, we won't, we won't settle for that. There will be some monuments in there of uh, related to the units that were there, because that's part of the history. But Knox Metropolitan United, which had its last service June 16th on 109th Street, because they, they amalgamated five churches now into one by the body do, which is something that says something else too, that it's, their membership has decreased, have donated four huge bronze plaques that were for members of Old Strathcona that passed away in, during World War One, World War Two. Oh, really? Yeah. So it's really kind and nice now, because yeah. the person who called me up was now a colonel of mine, Colonel Don Brody, who's retired, and he liked the idea. And, their church used to be right over on uh, Calvary Trail, just on the other side of the park. So this little park was here, they would be right over there. And then they sold that because cost factor and everything else. So what we're doing is we're bringing in, excuse me, it's called a nose bird. As soon as I change from outside to inside, it just runs. Um, we've incorporated very personal aspects of Old Strathcona. And when they're in the church, that's great, but the only people who see them are the ones who go to that church. When they'll be in this project, they will be forever immortalized in that. What, the, what church are you talking about? Uh, Knox Metropolitan, it's located on uh, 109th yes, Street. Yes, I know, is that, but, it, but it's going to be torn down, I think. I think they're selling it, we don't know, but oh, they, yes, the, yes. the parish has now moved to a different, yes, different true. over yeah. in Bonnie yeah. Dune area. And well, what about the church beside the library there? Oh, it's still going, but it's a... Uh, That's an evangelical yeah. free church. Yeah. yeah. Will it yeah. knocks? It's, it's a historic it'll building. It'll stay there forever, I'm quite sure. Uh -huh. 
So maybe the church chose to, to sell it that's there. It's historic also. Mm -hmm. So maybe not going too many places. And what role does the uh, the Anglican Church you mentioned play? Well, Holy Trinity being the uh, regimental church for South Alberta Light Horse and the 19th Alberta Dragoons. And, uh, but it's not in the park, it's quite a No, it's, it's over on the other side. Yeah. So 101st Street, but it was very directly related to the entire so we still history. have there uh, a couple of uh, flags inside oh, the yeah. old yep. dusty. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Evan confused yeah. leaders, which yeah. is yeah. also now a park. Yeah. They also have a flag in there that came from, I want to say, the 19th Alberta Dragoons, but they don't have any of the real colors, which are unique to a regiment. Yeah. I mean, there because they all went back to regimental lines for the museum. And the main museum for South Alberta Light Horse is in Medicine Hat. Was the minister at Holy, was the parish priest at Holy Trinity then the chaplain for this? He was not during World War One. The, the, the chaplain, he was a chaplain, but subsequently they never actually utilized him because the armed forces went to having a chaplain's service. Yeah. And the chaplain services back then basically commit, were either Catholic or Anglican. You know, oh. maybe you didn't have a lot. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, yeah. Protestant. Yeah, basically that's, that's exactly what we look at. Right. Now, of course, the chaplains, regardless of what their background is, whether they are Muslim or they are whatever, are supposed to be universal. They're supposed to be able to address mm -hmm. anybody that's in the military directly mm -hmm. and help them with their spiritual needs, which is, is good. And now they've, they've got new chaplains. Chris who, Pappas, who's an archdeacon in the church, Anglican church, is also sort of chaplain to them because we're putting on a project there and I'll, I'll get into that a little bit um, for South Alberta Light Horse members and their families being a regimental church is a, is, a, is a reasonable honor if your church goes that way and you usually don't give that up because it means more people paying attention and looking in donations and things like the organ renewal which costs 350 some odd thousands because mm -hmm. apparently it was a war memorial from World War One, mm -hmm. but you know, I was thinking more of a keyboard and a large speaker. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> However, that being said, mm -hmm. so the project is hopefully going to be done in time for the uh, centenary of the end of World War One, which is 2018. Mm -hmm. We were hoping to mark the anniversary of Vimy because that's when Canada became a country unto itself. They say, oh, I think we also became a country into ourselves when we were gift granted that, but then he helped. Mm -hmm. um, we did have an opening, grand opening with the Countess of Wessex, who is the Colonel in Chief for the South Alberta Light Horse. Sweet woman, very good looking woman, and we we're always pleased to have her around, so she's probably coming back next year. Oh, oh. she was here? Yep, yeah. uh, this year. June 24th. Oh, okay. So we, we had that all set up for her, and we did a ceremonial dig and everything else. Uh -huh generated enough media, so media helps keep things alive and going. Yeah. I've never been on media, but now I apparently have their first names. So, mm -hmm. that being said, it's a worthy project in the fact that it's the uniqueness that it is. It's not just going to be a monument to war, a mm -hmm. done deal, everybody walks around going, okay, well, my war wasn't here, I don't belong. So that leads into the next segue. The, being the regimental church, what we did for uh, South Alberta Light Horse is they're a reserve unit. And yes, if you serve, you can go to Veterans Affairs if you have PTSD or you have any issues that they might cover. Sadly, a lot of the reservists have real jobs. They don't have the time to dedicate to going to Veterans Affairs. It's now become a huge bureaucracy. Before it was kind of, okay, you're hurt, you're in the military, we look after you. So what happens is if they don't get their case that they file, uh, you know, certified, put through, that means they don't get benefits for it, which means their spouses or family members don't get benefits. And looking around this room, I'm sure we all know people who went to war and what it did to them. I've never been to a combat zone. I, well, I guess you could look at it as I was most fortunate that I spent most of my time training, or unfortunate if you wanted to be a guy with millions of medals. Metals don't mean a lot to me. I kept checking and they don't open. There's no chocolate in them, so I don't see the benefit. And I keep losing the darn things. They're expensive. <laughs> so and my wife makes me wear them now, so none of them are for great things of value. They're all for super good service and being there for 12 years, not getting 
jailed or losing rank or any of that stuff, which unto itself is probably a monument to me, because we kept wondering why I didn't get jailed many a time. But she knows that because she was married, not married to me at the time, but served with me. But we came up with this program for the South Dakota Light Horse, and it is a mental health initiative. And its idea is that if they get denied by Veterans Affairs, we can set them up with, um, as we call it in the military, duck bonkers. So psychiatrists, you know, those type of people. And we can look at them or their, their family and set them up through a referral system to provide them with that open resource. And um, Momentum Counseling is now involved. They're down on 82nd. Just by the bridge where Denny's is, as you go down. Mm -hmm. East. Mm -hmm. East. Mm -hmm. So they're involved, which is really good because they put on counseling group things that are $10 a shot. So we can either send them to a psychiatrist for $180 an hour and three visits to get them into the system and maybe help them to appeal their case and get covers, whatever. Or we can go to the monument moment momentum counseling where they can get help. Now the whole process of the mental health initiative was based on all of the um, services and ministries that Holy Trinity Anglican provides and one of them is uh, art, artwork, yeah. you know, where there's going to be art therapy if somebody wants to go. Apparently it's been very good with people with PTSD. I have not tried that route yet for mine and going through some other stuff. But it's also got uh, the theater aspect. This Holy Trinity's big on theater. But yes, it is. Nine fringe shows there this year. And I can't wonder why the people that are helping there are thinning out. Because <laughs> they're burnt out. <laughs> Which means we have another ministry to look after the burnt out people. <laughs> but um, we're going to allow, set up, we set aside tickets so the members of the South Carolina Force can come out, go to a theater group, sit amongst people that are safe, pretty much, you know, it's always dark, so they don't feel like they're on spotlight. And it helps them to reintegrate into people, because one of the things you go through with PTSD is a total lack of desire to be around crowds. And I say that from experience, because I might be able to stand in front of people and pitch something, but I'll go home afterwards and be shaking, mm -hmm. because of what I went through with the military. Again, not combat, but friendly fire, so it wasn't that bad, because it was friendly. Mm -hmm. um, you can always rest easier on that than the military says, but it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, and certain other things that happen in the military. So this mental health program will have art therapy, it will have theater, it will have art shows where they can just come, you know, even if it's just eat muffins and get a coffee they haven't had in two days. Bring their family to something that they can do jointly as a family. And uh, the counseling service. So that was passed through the diocesan, Anglican diocesan, mm -hmm. I should know this because I did it. June, May or June of last year, and they had a program going on which was a, called the REACH campaign, which we write, affectionately was called the Wretch campaign, because a lot of people didn't like it, and it was to raise money for the Anglican Diocese to do such things. Thankfully, they processed it through without question or any anything. They just kind of went through, so I, now if you, you know, don't believe in God, this is a thing you would, because never think goes through the Anglican Foundation without a lot of questions. <laughs> so they've chipped in money and matching funds. So we have something like $57,000 a year over the next three years as a pilot project for this. Now, I say that because Netta and I started chatting once again before a bunch of other people, oh, and some of the beauty guys were there, I'm sure, about perhaps getting the interfaith center involved on the idea that we could pool resources from the churches and people that are part of the interfaith. Mm -hmm. So if you were a Sikh and you came into looking for help to one of the churches, we'd be able to send you to one of the Sikh churches that participate if you were Jewish, because the Jewish family services is incredible, but many people don't know about it unless you go to that synagogue, right. or right. to one of the synagogues, I guess. So this is something that the Interfaith Center I'm hoping will entertain, mm -hmm. because it's the old story, you know, 10 people put in $10, you have 100, one person puts 100 and the rest stand by, and they burn off that 100. We could have had those extra resources to build and carry on. Mental health is a huge issue, mm -hmm. and it's something that faith does help. Uh, my belief in my faith has kept me going when things have 
failed around me. You know, when you're being shelved and you're standing there going, please, Lord, remember me, God, you know. If you can give me bullet shoot a bulletproof under shorts, that would be the time now. Mm -hmm. And when you get through it afterwards, you kind of look going, okay, yes, you know there's a God. So that's something I'm hoping the Interface Center we can pick up on. And it's a conversation for down the line. Mm -hmm. It's not in stone because I, I can't chisel and be, I don't like to carry the stones around. Mm -hmm. don't know how Moses did it, but he must have <laughs> real strength. <laughs> so that ties into the healing and remembrance service. We put on one, I'd say five years ago, and like everyone else says four, so I think I'm right. Mm -hmm. But we had it over Trinity Lutheran, which has an elderly German population. And these guys come out, you know, and to all the different functions, and my short hair and the way I carry myself screams military, better cop, but usually military. And they pat you on the back and call you Kameraderan, which I know exactly what that means in German. The other 20 words of pidgin German I learned while I was over there. And you can tell what they were doing in 1944-45, whether by choice or not, they were serving, because the other choice was to be killed. Uh, they were loyal Germans, they weren't Nazis. You know, they were people that stood up for their country, much like the English, much like in Pakistan, India, and Africa, the tribes, whatever. But at the outcome of that, they were left with scars that were never addressed. Yes. So a healing remembrance service was designed for them to come it's, it's got the Interfaith Center involved. It's got members of the U of A chaplaincy. So Audrey was there. Um, the Lutheran Church, which hosted it, the Anglican Church, we pitched in the funds. Um, we had East Indian food, because Nana Licious put their, their two bits in, because the Anglican Church has been helping them out too. And not that any one group was the hero in this, but when you walked into that healing remembrance service, you could see around you, we had a one of the people who used to be on the Muslim, uh, Muslim chaplaincy at U of A, and I think he's still part of Interfaith, isn't he? No, well, he's yeah. a member. He's a member. He's yeah. a life member for yeah. sure. So he's Sheikh on the board. or Zach at the U of A yeah. for it. Yeah. So Sheikh came to help out. So we have a Muslim representative. We have a Jewish representation. We had as many faiths that we could go. We were a little light on some, but you know, it's the first major year we started doing this, and. The idea was that it was welcoming. And people sat through the service. Um, this was how it was set up. We had uh, interdenominational tunes, so nobody felt left out. We had a uh, First Nations lady from, she works at the, what I call, Anglican HQ. And she came and blessed it <coughs> and opened it based on meeting on. Treaty 6 property, and it's important in that because a lot of First Nations have gone through their horrors, as we know from the TRC, and nothing's really, I don't think, been designed other than the TRC to deal with it, and now that's in the wrap-up phase and then putting it into this church service was hopefully going to draw some of them in where they could sit amongst people, and the two keys was they have gone through conflict or war, whatever it is, whether it was residential schools in conflict, whether it was war, whether they saw it as a war of aggression, we don't put the titles to it. But they could look around, sit amongst other people that have been impacted by it, from all countries, all backgrounds, and know that they were not alone, and know that what was heard was, yes, even if we don't know where you were, when the war impacted you, or whatever war it was, we respect that. And it's an adjunct to Remembrance Day, because a lot of people don't feel that Remembrance Day does anything. I'd done, this would have been 37th year, I would have been prayed for Remembrance Day. 36 of them, well, I was standing there, either freezing or this year, which was fabulous weather. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no snow, no freezing. Mm -hmm. I used to be in a Highland Regiment in my early days out on the coast, and I'll tell you that, with cold wind coming up off the water of Victoria, coming back down on Wahoo, you know, a oh. Chinook was, was, it was a breeze of, inter of interesting time frames. So, um, we sat there and we did a bunch of um, songs, generic prayers. We were hoping to incorporate more from different faiths. We had people reading, Netta read, Audrey read, and uh, there were some else I should know, but I was too busy making sure everything was happy. Uh, so we had a litany of peace, which was very generic. But in between, we had a, um, an exercise. 
and it was set up in two, four different ways. Please work. Please. So it, it's going to be hard to see, and I apologize. We had an altar set up at the front. The first couple of pews, we had pictures in them of just generic pictures. You can pass this around. You can all do things with it. So people could go to this state, this um, state part of it, and see a picture that spoke to them, whether it's about the people they lost, the war they were involved, or how they were feeling to, to express their emotions. And then we had, I took too many pictures of that, obviously. We had this little stone. There's stones put out there, and the idea is you would hold one, and you would put into it all the angst, the hurt, the memories. You'd place them in those stones, and then it's symbolic. And you could take those to your place of worship and leave them in the garden somewhere so that you could see them as you came in or talk to the rocks when you go by, knowing you're, that was there. But most people chose to put them, yeah, way too many pictures, on this where, altar. Where was this held? Trinity Lutheran. Oh, oh, oh. Because my, my, my church didn't seem to put a lot of interest in it until it became media worthy and popular. Oh, Not that I'm saying my rector does that, but mm -hmm. he sees a good thing and latches on. So in the end, there was the rocks, there was the pictures, uh, oh, I have one of those, not just these pictures, but we had a station where, I didn't get a good picture of it, where people could take a blank piece, no, oh, it's my garden, you're not interested in the leaks. Um, people could go, if you want to take a look here, that's the, the altar, where they could take a piece of paper and draw an image, whether it was their faith, whether it was but would attempt at somebody that they knew. For me, it would have been an ugly Picasso because they don't draw well. But um, they were able to put to their the pictures over. their impact and speak to that and allow that. And then at the end, like in the end of uh, the music, you would go up to that altar and you would put the stones there, or you put the drawings, or you pick the picture that spoke to you. And by doing so, you were able to say, "I'm giving this over." Now. I'm not a huge good guy for speeches sometimes, but what I did say at the end was, mm -hmm. may the God of your faith, because again, we wanted to keep it generic, we want to keep it open, take, look after you, lead you, and, and give you a sense of peace. Know that your, your sufferings and all that you've gone through, you're not alone anymore. All of us in this service are bearing that on our shoulders as well. So it's a true interfaith aspect in that. We were there for people, we had somebody from everywhere someone from every church and backgrounds that came to it. So it was really nice in that. And, and literally at the end of the service, we had a little reception, partly because we wanted to make sure that nobody was, things were churned up so badly that they couldn't drive home safely or get home safely. And we had a few mental health experts there just, just to talk to them, and the clergy just to talk to them from the different churches, you know. So if they were not linked to their faith anymore, they could relink to whatever it was, or whatever they liked, or they could go faith shopping, because we had enough people represented there that they could ask questions. But the main idea was to start by making sure they're safe and that they got home, because the last thing you want in a service like this is somebody getting lost, or injured, or in an accident. So it was really good, it was just over an hour. We had 64 people that I counted, and then I ran out of fingers. You saw the people's too, so we think there was about 70 odd people, which was a huge, uh, more, a lot more than the first one. The last, first one was about 20. And we did that at Trinity Lutheran again. And we had a number of people there. One had just lost their son-in-law in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. where I lost a lot of friends. Mm -hmm. uh, there were German, that older German people that said, you know, we spent the first part of the war running away from Nazis. And then we had to spend the next part of the, after the war running away from Russians, yes. who were not at all conciliatory in their approach. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty hard for them. They, they lost where they lived, changed nationalities three times, four times, or whatever. But when they went through this, yeah, it's, you know, hopefully you can see all the pictures there. Mm -hmm. I tried to eliminate all the extra ones there before I got here. Because <laughs> I realized you didn't need to see our project at home. People came out of that, they lifted, they went two inches higher, smiling, they had tears. Um, one of the ladies that there was there was German. And she witnessed her father being killed by the Nazis because they thought he wasn't doing his part for the war. Oh. And she saw this right as a little girl. 
mm -hmm. you know, and that's not an easy thing to let go. Yeah. So it really touched people's hearts in a lot of ways. It very, very much spoke to the interfaith aspect. Yeah. Because in the Army I used to say they used to give us an eight hour course on diversity and that was recognizing different faiths, people that had immigrated, same sex, all the little key points that the Army would have known that time. Mm -hmm. uh, the eight hours translated to me to my lecture at Stanford for my food. Here's a pin, you don't hold it, poke your hand. What would you want to do that for? Because I'm trying to practice that mature acupuncture. Just poke your hand. Mm -hmm. And I say, you see that color? It's in all of us. Mm -hmm. We don't have to go any further than that. And if you're covering me, and you're from a different church or a different background, you're still my best friend. And if I'm covering you, you really want me to be your best friend too. And so, you know, Canada has become a place now of, of very significant cultural diversity. Yes. Yes. We were slow on the uptake for a lot of years, but we're learning to respect that. And this, this is what this service spoke to on the heels of the uh, mental health initiative. Yeah. Excuse me. We have garnered national interest on this. They did a paper article in the Sun, Edmonton Sun, in the Edmonton Journal on October 31st. Uh, so people were looking into that. And then the radio people started calling. So I did um, online with Calgary, CBC, November 3rd, I think. And that was just to talk about the program, which then CBC Ontario found quite interesting. Because 20 years ago, they did a piece out in Ontario on Remembrance Day. And their, their story was that there was a Somalian who immigrated here. I think it was in 1990, I think we brought the first 25,000 <coughs> Somalians into the country. And they were all in Ottawa for the most part. And uh, this person standing there, he says, you know, I've been through all these horrors, but Nobody speaks of our background. What we did, it's not generic. Mm -hmm. Sadly, Remembrance Day was never intended to be, yay, we're the victors, yay, God's on our side, and we run around. It is a day we remember those who were lost, those who stood for freedom. But the initial concept of Remembrance Day, back when they did the 11th hour and the 11th day, 11th month and all that, was to remind humanity of the horrors of war to say them no more. You know, so many people, countries, turned up in upheaval, lives destroyed, property, livestock, you name it, pick anything, you know. And it was so significant that in some places there, now you go over to Europe, you can still see the bomb craters. And that speaks to, you know, almost 100 years later, those bomb craters still show. Now, imagine somebody who was sitting on the side of them and might have survived, but three quarters of the people he was there with didn't and they would have been a mishmash. Australians, New Zealand, Commonwealth troops, probably had the odd German there because uh, prisoners of war were taken aback, whatever. But, um, so that's what it was meant to be, and it's lost sight of that. You know, they get us to put our dinner gongs on and our best dip and tucker on Remembrance Day, and we stand there. Three years into doing all those parades, I realized that there was something missing. And that's just after I joined the military. It was the fact that it didn't speak to who Canadians are. Almost all of us probably got here by way of some immigration of some sort. That's yeah, true. My father was born in Britain, which makes me first generation on, on his side. My mother's great-grandmother, her grandmother was uh, German, moved over here. And so we were third generation, fourth generation Canadian. But when people come over here now, they come to this country for what it stands for. And that's respect of faiths, that's the respect of people's uniqueness, diversity. And it means that they come here and they become Canadians. You know, we're also used to saying Afro-Canadians or Indi in in Indian, uh, Indo Indian, Indian, sorry, Indian, there's a word for it, but Vanna wasn't doing the vowels for me, I was losing it. <laughs> but you know, we used to use those titles, but really, why do we use those? Do we need to? Yeah. We're all yeah. all of the same place. We're here, we're Canadians, and we've gone through the horrors. So that should be incorporated. The true meaning of Remembrance Day. <laughs> this service is not to knock out Remembrance Day, but it's to provide another service. There's a lot of people that 
in African countries that were forced to be childhood soldiers, yeah. not by choice. Even in the end of the war with Germany, a lot of kids literally were on the front line. Their choices were death or not been, maybe not being killed. But they don't feel right about Remembrance Day because they don't feel that they're, they're part of it. It doesn't really speak to everybody. And the Peace Walk, they feel a little hypocritical. The Peace Walk had been on the odd one, but like me, I'm 20 years odd, 222 if you count that time, in uniform in the military. And the Peace Walk seems slightly hypocritical to me that I'm on there because the things that I had to do and things I was. But um, this thing right in the middle. And the hope is that people will find a sense of meaning and a sense of fitting in, that they might just go to Remembrance Day and they'll see it not as the yay, we won, God was on our side, and see it as a time to remember. And if they do it in this part and have donated to get a stone done, they're having their loved ones remembered and they're standing amongst it. So that even if it's not even spoken, it's unspoken, that it's there for them. And that is the, the great intent of it, and that's what we're trying to do. So the park has one thing in common with all the rest of these themes. It's where we hold the Remembrance Day now. The Premier currently still comes to that, as she always did when she was in MLA, which brings its own set of individual things, like everybody who's a somebody has to come out to that parade to hang around and be seen and noted and hopefully get a picture taken. I kind of question their logic of being there sometimes, but that's okay. Her, uh, her heart and mind is with the, the area that she represents, and Linda Duncan comes out, and she's an absolute sweetheart, and more and more people are coming out to this, and this service in Old Strathcona, because they, hey, they don't like the Butter Dome, because first of all, it's a very, very long Remembrance Day service, because they got the light, everybody's got to lay a wreath. So, you know, 14th cousin to the third person that might have been at the war, whose brother knew about them and said, you should come, you may lay a wreath now. So you either fall asleep or you just get numb bum from sitting in those bench seats. But this one's very community. And it's right in the community. It incorporates different faiths. It incorporates a service just before it speaks in. So we, we, we have this one on November 10th, and I think we're going to stay with that. The CBC Radio Ontario had a call-in function, too. So people were calling in to talk about it. First person who called in said, my dad she was German and fought for Germany. And we have never felt that we should be on this remembrance of prison. Because they do speak of the evils of World War II, and that's fading out because a lot of veterans from World War II are thinning now with age. So, you know, we don't have the last World War I veteran for Canada died and he lived in the States, down uh, Washington State. And that was two years ago. He was a boy soldier, but nice guy. But the last of them were gone. So, two keep people involved and to give them an, out, an outsource that they can relieve themselves of the hurt and, and that. The <coughs> for that. And like I said, the mental health aspect is there and if we get more people involved and more churches involved and more groups involved, we can do a lot more for people. Well, I thought the, you know, at the service at the uh, All Saints, when the minister from the Lutheran Church spoke, she certainly had a captive audience when she oh, introduced yeah. the fact that it was her father who was in that. Uh, mm -hmm. Didn't you think Holy so? Trinity, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's Ingrid Dorsch. Yes. yes. And Ingrid was at the very first. She's an absolute wonderful woman. I love her pieces. And no, not she, I mean, that. I love you so um, She put it on, and she was sitting there. After the end of the first ceremony, there was tears. A lot of people were feeling tears and um, hearing some of the stories. And she got up and she said to me, you know, you know, because she was born literally at the end of the war. Still in the rubble. I mean, Germany had places that were and been looked after in the early 50s. Um, and she said, this is the first time in my entire life. And I think, without getting slapped by her later on, she's about 10 years old now. So we'll just say that. And um, she said, it's the first time now that I have been able to ever forget my country of origin for what it did. Really? And she just, she said, this is fantastic. So like I said, in subsequent years, we tried to renew it. There wasn't the interest from the Anglican side, but then the first thing was the mental health program, which now has gained a lot of attention, and the service to sort of connect with it, <coughs> and the involvement in the park. 
So it's, it's working out that we have that. And the service here is, is like I said, it's just, it's so nice because, I mean, nobody gets outside and you don't get a lot of protection when it snows or it rains. But for those who've been in the Army, we haven't got much when you're sitting out there. Yeah, so we're kind of broken in. It's, it's a real community, and that's what speaks to the whole thing. And our community is diverse. Our community is multicolored, multi background. And I was pleased and thrilled that Winter Big Center came online with me because I think it was something that they were hoping to promote more. And I know because I talked about it. You talked about it the year before. I did it. I don't know. It was talked about. And uh, we have every intention of carrying it on. And we hope that with the community interest across the country, that there will be more of these popping up. I've been fielding a number of Facebook inquiries and email inquiries. And I've share, I share with them the, the service. I share with them the outline. I share with them the pictures that uh, we did of the different um, pla places in the church that you could go and do the different things, the writing or coloring or drawing, picking a picture, doing the stone. And it's, it's a very, very interesting side view of it because you see all people going up there and putting them on the altar. Some of them decided to leave them all on the stone table because they thought that was going to add a candle and then to itself it was an altar, mm -hmm. but a generic altar. You know, we got to hear from people from all the back backgrounds and face, which added that, again, that entire um, perspective that you don't have on the remembrance day. And I didn't have time my uniform for it, which was really good. Because mm -hmm. the group I now belong to, I, I go to them as the parade marshal in Old Strathcona. What it means is I can walk around and not get freezing cold. I wear my gloves because if no one else has them, I don't worry about it. And be there for people that are starting to have issues on the parade, like they start to faint or something, I can take care of them. But it, it's all unique and it all comes together. And it's been just wonderful. And this year was proving exactly what we thought it would do. Mm -hmm. uh, Ingrid has said Trinity Lutheran has no problems with continuing to host it. So we have a venue. And we have the chaplaincy at U of A, which was probably going to expand next year, because a lot of people, it came up and they were talking to them a little later than we thought, because we didn't get off the mark as quick as we wanted to do this year. A m bunch of things, my rector was <coughs> in the running for a bishop position in Spokane, Washington, so he was kind of not around for a long time. Ingrid was on holidays, so you know she always goes up to Hyde Y in BC, and she needed it. So. Next year, we're going to get off the mark earlier. Are there sure. signs uh, put up around here to identify the name of the park? Oh, there's a sign that was put in uh, <coughs> just last year. After it was named in 2012, it was two and a half years. Because I think the people who wander into the park won't get all of that information. They won't initially. No, initially. Yeah. At all. But what we did is we placed the park, the park sign on the Calvary Trail side. Mm -hmm. Because then people are looking at it and not worried about oncoming traffic. Oh, yeah. They can see as they go by, it's a lot more open. So do, do you have any kind of signage that will indicate the, the services that you're providing, mental health services? How will they know about that? Oh, that was pitched to many people. It's gone out through a number of churches. And if we the interfaith book comes on, the interfaith center comes online, it'll be announced through that. And the, the member churches, member. And, and what about the farmer's market for, say, an exterior sign uh, for publicity? We can do that. The city charges for every sign that you put up, like the old park signs. Because I wandered all over here when I was at the Fringe, but I haven't been at the Fringe recently. But uh, now if I go to the park, I'll have a new understanding mm -hmm. of the meaning of the place that I never had before. Well, no, I never knew that the cenotaph was there. No, no one would. They, they sort of put it in an unnamed park, yeah. which is when we started doing the monument movement. So we said, how do we pitch the monument in the unnamed park? Yeah. So we sent it to it, and people all voted on a few names. And the previous planning officer of the unit and I worked very hard together. And uh, we got the name White Horse Park put through so that we can help people, not only where it is, but we need a few of these signs around somewhere. We will probably do something like that. There will be plaques put up, the intent is to have them showing the history and then and current. Yeah. So I would like to see that 
put up because it speaks to a lot of elements. Yeah, yeah. yeah of course. We Particularly on the, on the memorials building uh, the old armories. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have to do things carefully in that because it's a heritage building and they sometimes don't allow things to be put up there. Yeah. Like if Yes even wants to block a window there yes. or anything, they get a year or yeah. Mr. Gelhart in the city is a wonderful individual and he looks after the historical aspects of everything. And he knows his stuff, because our house is unique, apparently, in the Norwood area. And he came up with the cost of bringing back to the standard to get heritage status was like, yeah. no. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, especially after we got all of these new things on it, we're not coming back. No. But we, yeah, we, we're going to try to, to incorporate that. One of the great aspects of the park, too, is that if we have the funds that we expect to get and hope to get, is that we're going to give a stipend to the S armories so that the kids that are there, teens and early 20s, can take a, a part in the park by going out and picking up a litter mm -hmm. and monitoring the idea behind uh, graffiti. Mm -hmm. Since most of them are doing it, they might stop because they're now mm -hmm. being paid not to, but... Yeah. That's the ownership it, there. Yeah, yeah, and it gives the kids yeah. Yeah. a sense of community. It allows them to have something to write on their CV, you know, community service, Mm -hmm. um, sure. Whatever they're going to call it in ten years, you know, no, garbage man doesn't really go anymore. Sanitation engineer. By then, it'll probably be, you know, expert yeah. on garbage momentum or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> but it'll bring yes into the mix. Mm -hmm. And I was working out of that army for a while, and the kids, as much as they're a wild bunch, as well as just they have a lot of addiction issues, a lot of pain. The mental health thing could probably help them as well. And they were interested in taking ownership to that level, which would reduce a lot of criminal complaints to the department. Yeah, okay. We would be um, taking the handle measures. I was wondering about the wonderful lunch that was provided there after the service of Holy Trinity. Was that the yes that did that lunch, or was it the yes the people? put on? Yeah, at the armory. So were the kids involved in? A lot of them would have been. Yeah, because yeah, that was prepared. really good. Yeah. And, and it, it's amazing because people go in and talk to these kids. Yeah. It's like the the, the, the common drunk that sits on the corner of your street and he's been there for four years and you never asked his name. As soon as you ask their name and you remember them, they come alive. Yeah. And it says amazing. People take interest in them. A lot of these kids came from broken homes, victims of abuse, mental, physical. Um, and I was a youth pastor up until just the end of this year for Holy Trinity Anglican and Detroit stuff for the Lutherans. And, you know, parents know me as that. But when I went over to work there, youth is a passion. I've been youth pastor for, I'll say 10 years because I can't remember what, what, how many years. 10 is always a safe bet. But youth, you can get them squared away before they're 18. All the things that happened then are, before that aren't permanent. And um, that's why we wanted to involve them. Please, yeah, take anything you want. This is a picture, by the way, of uh, Steel Park. You know, we'll, you'll see that. It's um, troops heading off in World War I. So it's, it's one of the few, few pictures I probably want to take it. We're hoping to have them, them come out of the woodwork soon by um, maybe doing a display at the S Armories and hopefully in conjunction with them. Because they, they like that when people go there and they see it and they make donations. Mm -hmm. And they're having a real tough code these days for donations. Like everyone, they're all competing for the same pot of money, <coughs> same grants. So. To go back to your earlier part of the, the beginnings at the Monterey Oak Old uh, Ranch to near Morley and, and Southern Alberta, and we understand from history that he donated about three or four carvels of horses. And the family story was they certainly ain't broke. <laughs> no, and they had to have somebody with a unique concept of horsemanship to do that. And BC may have produced some people, but Alberta was a little more established, you know. And the people that were here were true horsemen. They had to get around the movie thing. You know, it was an awfully long walk from Calgary up here or something. I mean, the train ran, but yeah, that money. Yeah. So, this, like I said, incorporates all that history, all that community, 
all the diversity, and it does so in a kind and considerate way by providing resources to help those who need it on multiple levels. Yes, that's long gone now. So mm -hmm. this is this is what we're doing, what I'm doing apparently too. So. <laughs> Because every time I try to fob it off on Linda Duncan or the Premier's office, you keep saying, no, oh, no, you raise your hand, you're dealing with it. <laughs> so it's kind of nice. Well, it is good. Yeah, it is, it's interesting. I mean, it's not beyond my capabilities. I don't. Well, you've done a lot. You know, I hate the sound of my voice on radio. Apparently, oh, no, you say that. I heard, the one, heard you on the 180, which is the national program, yeah. BBC Radio. It was excellent. That was the Calgary one, yeah. You were excellent. But it's national TV. Yeah. It's yeah. national radio. Yeah, and the other one was uh, Ontario Today, and it was run on November 11th. That's the only reason it wasn't on parade. Mm -hmm. And I consider what I was doing a part of the Remembrance concept, so mm -hmm. I can still say I served in some way on there, but in a more generic and respectful way. Mm -hmm. So we have about three minutes left. Does anybody have any questions they think I might be able to answer? Mm -hmm. If well, not, I will find the answers for you and get back to you. <laughs> I was thinking the CBC is a very good uh, medium for uh, projects <coughs> like this. Uh, the, the announcer on the morning show, Mark Connolly, yes, he's all over the city, mm -hmm. and maybe something like this would be. When we opened the park, we had CBC News, CTV News, due to on-screen, on-camera interviews. I was with uh, that. We had the Metro, the Sun, the Journal, do paper articles, and there was a CBC Edmonton did uh, a radio okay. shock show with it. Uh -huh. So all of those people now are in the back pocket, not the back pocket, that's not the way to say it, are there as backup. Mm -hmm. They want to know when things happen. They all came out mm -hmm. for the oh, Countess's visit. Mm -hmm. And they all came out to see the new sign, mm -hmm. and I think it's got it got that support part because again it links in fringe and anyone else who's, who uses this park. And well, this yeah, it, it isn't uh, Connolly. It's, it's Mark about town. Yeah. Yes, and he's at various venues, and so you know that. Uh, and I think, of course, there are a lot of us who are CBC listeners. <laughs> yes, we are. Yeah, my family is too. Yeah. My wife did it more than I, but I listen to it now. Yeah, so. so it's interesting that way. And now we've got a government that's actually kind of supportive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But yeah, they've been very, very good to both the Monument Project and this service. And I suspect it will be more down the line because I'm supposed to send them copies of the pictures from the service that I have. I would probably send all the ones of the, the pictures of pictures. <laughs> but we yeah. made, made aware of this because of your talk to us. Otherwise, I wouldn't have known anything about it. Oh, I certainly, yes. you know, that park was so we new need to me. It needs more day. public attention somehow. I don't know yeah. the, what is the way of doing it. Well, that's why we'll do the, the uh, centenary of Vimy. We're going to do the centenary of Passchendaele, things like that, and have mm -hmm. something in the park. Because I think it's important because kids don't even get taught that anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm old enough to, was I was taught about those wars. My wife's an imperial history professor. So that's exactly what she got, but mm -hmm. and they're going back to that, so, so well, my hour is up. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, I, will, yes, yeah. just think, I will just say that the Thursday night service was lovely. I, I was there, as, as Stephen said, and Audrey Brooks was there. Um, it, it, I think it, when it becomes an annual event, which, which I'm confident that it will, it will grow every year, although it's not about numbers, everybody who was there, yeah. and 65 people, as you said, is wonderful. It was contemplative, and, and it was just sweet. It was really yeah. sweet, and I was really happy to be there. And I know you want it to be interfaith, and that will grow, but it's hard. I think, first of all, m I would think many, many non-Caucasian immigrants see Remembrance Day as being very Caucasian and very Christian. Mm -hmm. And and that is it because it is because because it is it's a very white Christian thing Remembrance Day, but I think it is certainly going to people grow and I was so happy to be there. It was a really lovely couple hours. Gave another dimension to it. Absolutely, and yes. I don't go to Remembrance Day mm -hmm. ceremonies. I go to the Jewish Jewish cemetery has their own. I go there some years, not every year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, of all the calls that I fielded on the, the last interview, one called in screaming and yelling, how dare we, 
do this on the day of remembrance and I said to him, you don't listen very well, do you? Mm -hmm. I told you that we mm -hmm. did this before. Yeah, yeah. And some other lady had called in and she was doing a similar, mm -hmm. similar but yeah. Yeah. service, but doing it on remembrance day. Mm -hmm. That I knew would set mm -hmm. people, you know, excuse me, yelling, but every other person that called yeah. Yeah. had positive stuff to say.